You've had different roles in, in helping the Vatican and helping the church as U.S. ambassador to the Holy See. You served on a, a committee or commission that helped the Vatican Bank. Um, what is your observation about that kind of service? What is the one thing that you took away from that? Well, uh, the service was very different in the different pontificates. When I first came to Rome in the 1990s, in the early 1990s, it was a very exciting place to be. Uh, if you think back to that time, the totalitarian regimes in Eastern Europe were crumbling, and our pope, our charismatic pope, John Paul II, had been an instrumental figure in that. Besides that, he had galvanized millions of young people, and he had inspired lay people like myself to be more conscious of our lay vocation. But what happens uh, with such an active pope doing so many things is that administration in the Holy See during a very long pontificate uh, is left up to other people. And you know, they say when the cat's away, the mice will play. Uh, <laughs> That left Pope Benedict and now Pope Francis with some very difficult problems to solve. You brought up letters, John Paul II's letter to women, letter to the artists, all of these beautiful, beautiful letters that inspired so many people, inspired me personally, um, to get engaged in church service. A recent decree from Pope Francis, Motu Proprio, was asking for more transparency. Is that actually possible? I think it must be possible after five years on the board of directors of the Vatican Bank, I am more than ever convinced that Catholics have a right to demand transparency and accountability, not only in the Vatican, but all the way down to the parish level. And I'm happy to say in my parish, we have a wonderful financial responsibility. And thanks, I think, to the pastor's wise decision to look for expertise among the laity. Let's talk about defiance of church teaching and the global church. We have two great examples right now, China and Germany. China exiting any kind of influence from Pope Francis and choosing Catholic Church leaders, and then Germany with its um, rumors of schism in blessing same-sex unions. How does the church hold this tension? How does it hold this defiance and continue to pastor us? Of course, each situation is different, and each decision-making process weighs a lot of factors. Um, where China is concerned, of course, China is not subject to church discipline as the German Catholic Church is. And uh, it's, uh, I think, very difficult, at least it is difficult for me, to discern what is going on within the Holy See diplomatic core with respect to China. But I think one thing that uh, the Holy See could clearly do is speak out loudly about the very serious, China is probably the worst religious freedom violator in the world, not only to Catholics, but to Protestants and to the, the Uyghur Muslims. Muslims. Uh, and the Catholic Church as the Holy See has such a tremendous moral voice on the world stage that I think it would be very important and very effective. In fact, when the liberal democracies are kind of muting their criticism of China, it would be good for the Holy See to exercise leadership there. Where Germany is concerned, again, uh, how, how do you deal with a wayward child? Uh, in the past, popes, not many people remember this, in the past there were situations where popes put a whole country under an interdict. That's the technical term for something like uh, excommunication of a king or an individual, uh, but a whole country. Uh, and if you look it up, there are many, many instances historically. I don't think we quite reached the point, <laughs> uh, but it is a difficult problem. Religious freedom is something that I know that you prize very much and that you value and, and you talk about often. The persecuted church around the world has changed. What are the differences that you've seen in where we were when you were U.S. ambassador and where we are now? 
I think the, th the biggest difference is the threat to religious freedom in the Western liberal democracies has grown in ways that none of us anticipated, except possibly the great founder of the Beckett Fund, Seamus Hassan, who had remarkable foresight. Of course, the, uh, the difference between the kind of gross, violent assaults on religious freedom that we have internationally, the difference is very great in the liberal democracies, but nevertheless, the situation in the liberal, it's like there's a, there's a folk song about um, Pretty Boy Floyd where Woody Guthrie says, I've been around the world and seen lots of funny men, some rob you with a six gun and some with a fountain pen. You might say that uh, that's the difference between international religious freedom and so far freedom in the liberal democracies. But it's getting very serious in the liberal democracies. And how should um, lay people think about that? How should they consider both the defense of religious minorities and also the defense of Christians around the world? Well, what can I, they would, do? I would say the biggest challenge, the biggest threat to religious freedom right now, nationally and internationally, is that Unfortunately, most people do not think it's under threat. And this is partly uh, because these violations are underreported, especially if they're against Christians, they are underreported. And I think somehow I mean, lay people have to make their voices heard about that. These are, the facts are there. The Pew Forum has annual reports. Um, the State Department just had its report last week. Yes. So, well, so we have underreporting uh, in the media, and we also have, um, I think, a lack of due attention from the major human rights organizations who often are promoting ideas that are not even within the catalog of universal human rights. They're promoting certain Western rights that actually cause a lot of resentment in. Uh, and, and that's a kind of violation of religious freedom, too. You know the life on a university campus. You were talking about how hard it was uh, being a catechist um, and how much easier it was being on a u university campus. That's not always the experience of, of professors now, um, with cancel culture being so prominent. Tell us a little bit about what that was like for you. Did you survive the cancel culture? Well, I was fortunate to be at Harvard Law School, which I think is a, an excellent environment for conservative students. I, I always tell conservative students that uh, who want to go to law school, they're better off going to a large law school where there are many different points of view, both on the faculty and uh, among the students. But of course, it is deeply disturbing to read about what is happening on campuses around the United States, where tenured professors are actually losing their jobs for, I, I can hardly believe this is happening, but apparently it is, for only repeating language that they have heard others use in the context of a class where they're analyzing what others had done. Uh, this is very dangerous. In fact, uh, I think that it's uh, unfortunately, we're in a period where intellectual life in the country, real intellectual life, real respectful exchange of ideas is moving uh, out of the universities as it did in the 18th century from the universities <laughs> to the coffee houses. The question now is, where are the new coffee houses? Where is intellectual discourse taking place? So a woman like you who has had such an incredible journey and is having such an incredible journey in the church, both as a professor, a uh, lay leader, um, someone who represents the church internationally and is serving the church in different roles in the Vatican, when are you going to write your memoirs? <laughs> and what will be in them? <laughs> well, I'm thinking about it. Um, you know, uh, I'm under certain confidentiality obligations, but I can tell you a story about that, if you like. Uh, when I was asked by Pope Benedict to head a committee to see whether the bank the Vatican Bank should be closed or reformed, I uh, hired an expert and uh, before he went to work, I was told he has to be put under the pontifical secret. So we went into the Vatican Library, and there a cardinal had 
Terry Keeley, my good friend from BlackRock, put his hand on the Bible and he had to take word for word an oath about all the terrible things that would happen to him in this world and next if he violated any confidentiality. And I was standing there listening to that and it occurred to me after all the years that I had had various confidential positions for the church, I had never been put under the pontifical secret. <laughs> which tells you something maybe about administration in the Holy See. <laughs> in any case, uh, there may or may not be a memoir. And it is the fidelity of the church that keeps those secrets under lock for you, at least. <laughs> of course.